really delighted that we've got two colleagues joining us um, from the University of Warwick. Um, we've got Jonathan, who I can see on my screen now. Great to see you, Jonathan. Um, who's a professor of creative education and has been sort of very instrumental in shaping the evaluation and performance strategy in Coventry. And then a bit later, we're going to hear from Mark, um, Mark Hinton, who is community engagement development manager about how he's been applying this framework in his practice. But Jonathan, I thought maybe you could just spend a, a couple of minutes introducing yourself. And then my colleague Jack has your slides ready to launch. So hello, yes, I'm Jonathan Nealands. I just joined at the end of what was obviously a very powerful presentation and I caught the words passion and enthusiasm. And I just wanted to underline how important they both are to any evaluation or any civic project. And certainly we'll talk about that a bit. So I'm Professor of Creative Education in Warwick Business School, but I'm also Academic Director for Cultural Partnerships in the Executive Office at the University of Warwick. So I manage cultural partnership and obviously, as you would all know, Coventry is UK City of Culture 2021 for our sins. And uh, a lot of my time and work is, 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 is spent uh, working now actively on the evaluation of the City of Culture. But what I'm going to do in this presentation is just take you back, tell the backstory of it a bit and talk about how the university was engaged and show you some of the things that we've produced, if that sounds like a good idea. So I guess, you know, the journey for us um, began in 2015 when Warwick published the results of the Warwick Commission on the Future of Cultural Value, Enriching Britain, Culture, Diversity and Growth. This was a big national project, you know, the kind of uh, national project you might expect a university like Warwick to get involved in. One of the findings from that commission was that the 8% of the population who benefit most from publicly invested arts that we all pay for through the lottery and through tax are also the oldest, the whitest, the most well-educated and likely to live in London or the South East. On the back of the publication of that report, at the same time, Coventry decided that it would, um, it would put in a bid to be UK City of Culture in 2021. So this was a great opportunity for the university to walk the talk, to take some of the findings from the commission and apply them at a local level. And also, you know, the interest the university was interested to be more engaged in its place. Historically, Warwick wasn't that engaged in the West Midlands or in Coventry, looking outwards, looking internationally. But as of 2015, 2016, really began to take place very, very seriously indeed. So the first thing that we did, we were invited to put together a cultural strategy, a 10 year cultural strategy uh, for, for Coventry. And we did this through extensive consultations. So we spoke to over 2,500 different people in the city and putting this strategy together. It had five goals, which were not necessarily obviously cultural. So widening participation, but lifelong learning, uh, health and well-being. Uh, diversity, you know, broad, broad outcomes which are, came out of the consultation process. And on the back of that strategy, we then, uh, the university was um, led, led, was part of the team that put together the successful bid to be Coventry City of Culture in 2021. And that at the bottom, you can see we're now proud to be a principal partner. So if you'd like to move to the next, please, Jack. Oh, can I do it? Oh, I can probably do it as well. So um, we, the university's contribution, what part of the university's contribution to City of Culture is to uh, be responsible for the evaluation of, of the year. But this evaluation uh, began some time ago. It began at the point of the a point of we made the bid, the, the, the objectives, what we put in the bid, we thought about, all right, well, what's the basis? for that and how we know uh, whether we've, whether we've um, made progress, whether we've achieved our outcomes or not. So we've had an evaluation strategy in place and published and it's uh, 2019 to 2024. So the idea is that the evaluation will extend beyond the year of cultures so that we can look at longitudinal impacts and, and changes. The, the approach to evaluation is very much based on an, another document that the university is responsible for producing or part of a team producing, which is the Joint Cultural Needs Assessment Guidelines. Um, colleagues may be familiar that every local authority produces a Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, a JSNA, 
which is largely public health, but provides a huge amount of information about the state of public health and the local authority and how partners, not just public health, but others, education, uh, police, are going to work towards uh, improving outcomes for the city. And that, it, oh, sorry, yeah, there's a JSNA. So the, the JCNA plan, which very much underpins the, the uh, commentary evaluation and the bid. It starts with a place narrative. It starts with bringing people together, anchor institutions, organizations, individuals, community groups, to really think about who are we, where have we come from, and where are we headed? What do we want to become? What is the change that we seek? And to be very clear about that narrative, you know, it really is a story that everybody can buy into, everybody in the city can subscribe to. And also to, to, to understand the profile of the city, to understand the demographics, to understand the needs of the city. And from that, to work towards uh, identifying place outcomes. You now, what are the changes that we, that we want? What will the changes be that will bring us closer to our vision? And then from a cultural point of view to work out, so what are the cultural resources? What is the capacity which involves an audit which the university undertook? And then for cultural organisations working together to decide, OK, well, if that's the change the city speaks, the, the city seeks, how can culture contribute to that? How can culture make a difference? And from that to work out what the outputs would be, what the activities would be, and then finally back round to the monitoring and evaluation strategy. So this is quite a different approach that the university was leading, which was really about asking not what your city can do for culture, ask what culture can do for your city. That led to the development of, I know that you can't probably see this, I'm going to show you a, a snapshot of it uh, in a moment in the next slide, but that led to the development of a theory of change. We decided we would take a theory of change approach for a number of reasons, uh, not least that we noticed how uh, charity and development organisations are very keen on theory of change because any charity is very, very keen to make sure that every pound invested makes a difference and the theory of change is one way of securing that. So if you look on the right hand column, these are this is the vision. So these were the four impacts that came out of the consultation process and the bidding process. The Coventry citizens positively influence and shape the city they want to live in. Coventry's culture contributes to the social and economic, global and connected recognise the future facing. These are statements of what Coventry will be like, not necessarily at the end of 2022, but over a period of time, these will be the visible and material changes. And I think one of the attractions of using theory of change and using the language of outcomes and outcomes, is it closes the gap between aims and what is actually delivered. So from the beginning, you your, the discipline is to think about, all right, well, given the resources that we've got, what, what's manageable, what's a realistic change that we might expect, and then to monitor that. So theory of change, I'll show you a, bit, a little snapshot. So this is just one of them, for instance. So the impact is Coventry citizens positively influenced. Now, of course, culture on, it, on its own can't do that. But if the city, not just the cultural sector, but business, health, education, anchor institution, if the city buys into that impact, then we're all responsible for working towards it. But the cultural outcomes that we thought might contribute to that were an increase in civic pride, community led production and programming, increase in cultural participation and activism, leadership and programming and provision of career routes. And then if you go to the left, these are the outputs. So the theory is that if you produce these outputs, they will lead to these outcomes, which will contribute to these um, impacts. We're at a stage now where we're moving from a theory of change to a story of change. So uh, up to this point, the, uh, the, the orange, the orange. So if these are the, if these are the changes that we seek, what investment do we have available to us? What kinds of activities? what kinds of outputs, what kinds of outcomes will contribute to those longer term impacts and then to baseline and have KPIs against the outputs and the outcomes in particular. But now that the year is underway, we've moved to the story of change. So how and to what extent were the investments used to develop activity that led to outputs that contributed to outcomes that delivered transformational impacts for the people of Coventry? There is, uh, I think I might just 
Yeah, there is, you know, looking at it from a university point of view and particularly, you know, academic colleagues who've been engaged in it. This, this, this approach creates an interesting tension between artistic autonomy and artistic resp responsibility. So traditionally, artists are used to being funded to do work and to produce artworks which are valuable and important in and of themselves. In our approach, what we're asking artists to do is to produce work that will have a wider social benefit that will contribute directly to the outcomes in our theory of change. So all the planning and programming for City of Culture 2021 has been based on discussions with artists about how will your work make a difference to the people of the city? How will your work contribute to the broader outcomes that the city seeks? We've also developed a number of other tools to help us help us with that and to better understand communities. So this is our Coventry Cultural Place Profiler and what it does it digitally to combine uh, cultural data but also non-cultural data. So you can see the population figures for the city across the top. You can see the demographic breakdown of the city. You can see data on household income. You can see uh, the cultural data in the middle there, uh, national averages, city averages. And you can also see a number of other non-cultural variables which might affect cultural participation. So the extent to which uh, residents are satisfied with the local area, the extent to which they agree they can influence decisions right through to how safe do they feel at night if the cultural activity is being planned in the night time. And what we're able to do is to drill down that map so we can go down to ward level and you can see how the figures you can see how the figures change and we're looking at a ward called false hill which is one of our more deprived you can see it's twice the level of uh, deprivation in an already deprived city and it's one of the two wards that the university has been working on alongside torrington and canley which mark will talk about in a minute you can see that the ward as a whole uh, is predominantly asian uh, and you can see that the level of income is lower than the average for the city. You can see that there are fairly reasonable levels of cultural participation and you can see that they feel that residents in, in Falls Hill feel safer at night time than the, the average of the city. They're less satisfied with their local area, but more residents agree that they can influence decisions. Wards are a good unit to look at, but we go further. We go and look at, at neighbourhood level, uh, which we straight. You know, I'll go back to that one. Sorry. We can look at MSOAs, which are area neighbourhood areas, basically of between five and seven thousand households, and you can begin to see the differences. So, if we look at this neighbourhood in 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 Falls Hill. Uh, you can see, you know, the level of deprivation is not as high as across the ward as a whole. Levels of cultural participation are higher. Feeling safe at night drops. But if we if we walk three minutes, if we cross the road, we come to Upper Falls Hill, and you can see particularly that the levels of cultural participation drop off the scale. So only 11% of residents in Falls Hill are regularly engaging in the kind of arts which uh, receive some sort of public investment, some sort of public subsidy. You can see that the poverty level goes up in that ward compared in that neighbourhood compared to the one that we've looked at. But you can also see that the residents in that area feel safe. Again, it's predominantly Asian, but it's multi-faith. So there's, there's Hindu, Muslim and Sikh communities represented in the city. So if we're helping cultural uh, cultural organisations to plan what to do across the city in order to respond to needs, we can use this planning tool to help us with that. So traditionally, what cultural planners have, have done is to use what's called audience spectrum, which is, an, which is a, a way of uh, dividing the population up according to uh, their cultural needs and how likely they are to engage in culture. And if we go to the area that I was just, we've just been looking at, the Falls Hill, you can see that nearly 70% of them are in the Facebook families uh, group, um, which only makes up 12% of all households uh, in, in, in England. Younger, cash strap, strap less, least likely to think of themselves as arty. Arts and culture generally play a very small role in their lives. 
So what do you do? You understand the demographics, you understand how people feel safe at night, you understand the level of confidence they have in influencing decisions. It's predominantly Asian, but it's multi-faith. So we put on a carnival of lights, not a festival of lights, but a carnival of lights so that it doesn't, it's not you know, tied to one religion rather than another. It's free, it's at night, it's outdoors, it encourages everybody to come together. So that's the end of the slideshow. Gosh, there's so much um, to take in. In a minute, we'll hand over to Mark to sort of to develop the story. But I, I just wondered, um, again, I just really wanted to encourage people to use the chat to bring to begin to line up some questions for Jonathan about the approach. Um, I just had one very quick initial question for you, Jonathan, which was the relationship between what you showed us in the first half and the second half. So the first half, you were looking at a kind of outcomes framework in the theory of change. And then in the second half, you moved into some really helpful um, data and uh, about the, the place and the people. And, and how did those two things sort of come together in your work? So uh, they, they are completely linked. I mean, we don't separate evaluation from the whole, you know, the whole the theory of change. Mm -hmm. So if the theory of change, uh, one of the outputs in the theory of change is that culture is geographically distributed across the city. So we don't want it to just city of culture just to be in the city center. We want it to be in every neighborhood. So in order to plan for that, you need to understand the neighborhood. So evaluation helps you understand the neighborhood, helps you understand what the needs are, and then allows you to plan accordingly. And then we will evaluate the outcomes of that through surveying, through uh, all, all, all di di different methods. So evaluation has really been, it's never been the, um, it's never been seen as a, as a side activity or separated from the core business of planning and delivering um, the, the, the city of culture. You know, it's been evaluation led. It began with needs assessment, it began with benchlining, and then evaluation also helped planners and programs to understand what kinds of activities are likely to be successful for different people in the city. So on the first slide, we've made the target 80% of all residents will be will participate. And as you can see from the Upper Falls Hill, so we look at Upper Falls Hill, well, hang on, only 11 percent are. Mm. So from a planning point of view, that evaluation point helps them to think, all right, well, we really need to do some work in Falls Hill. We really need, but what kind of work should we do? Let's try and understand the makeup of the people and then design something that mm. will that will be attractive and which will people will want to participate in. Mm. It was so interesting when you talked about the tension between um, between sort of artistic autonomy and and sort of social responsibility. Um, I was really struck uh, by the parallel with, you know, a contrast within universities between sort of academic freedom and a kind of impact culture where we are being increasingly expected to also um, deliver value and to create positive sort of public benefit from, from the work and how you manage um, that process of allowing artistic integrity or academic autonomy, but at the same time, how you encourage people to be increasingly sophisticated and expert in how they yeah. plan their engagement. Um, yeah. and I mean, it's a dialectical relationship. It's, it's not an either or, it's, 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 it's not, a, you know, it's necessary artistic and integrity and necessary social responsibility in it. And it's finding the, the sweet spot but between that, you know, it's got to be artistically it's got to be artistically um, satisfying, it's got to be artistically made, it's got to appeal to the emotions, it's got to do all of that, but it's also got to you know, serve broader needs. Mm, thank you. Emily, did you want to pop a question before we turn to Mark? Yes, I just wanted to ask a question which sort of follows on a bit from Paul's, but um, it's specifically kind of, did you think there was something distinctive in terms of working through the lens of kind of culture and cultural activity and, and has this gone on to inspire I suppose other elements of the university you know other maybe people working through health or maybe people working through you know sort of other kind of subjects or dimensions that could become more civically engaged I wondered. Yeah I mean I think culture is a is an interesting portal it's not the most obvious and obviously there's a there's 
you know, university engagement in economic developments and all kinds of public health and all kinds of other developments. But I think, you know, cultures, I think it's the theory of change, which is really, really key. You know, and I think the challenge back to the university is maybe we need to think about the planning tools that we use. You know, I think one of the responses in the university is to understand just how powerful the theory of change is, particularly when it's publicly uh, publicly negotiated and mm. it's thought through and the logic is very, very clear to people. But culture is seen uh, in many places as being um, uh, a way of bringing about economic social regeneration, a way of changing perceptions about place. So it's a very powerful way of place making, place building. And universities obviously increasingly interested in that agenda through the creation of cultural compacts, through the creative people and places projects that universities are engaging with. And culture is, of course, as broad as you like. So what's been really exciting is to see right across the university from STEM to health, to languages, to history, you know, everybody buying in and wanting to be part of that, wanting to work with local cultural sector, wanting to work with local communities, wanting to showcase their work in the city rather than at the university. So it really has brought people together in a, in a very powerful and, and exciting way, yeah. It's just another thing, just comparing um, the approach that you've taken in Coventry with Sarah's approach in Winchester, one of the things that's so striking is on the one hand, both of you have dug really deep into very intricate and um, kind of intimate data and detail. Uh, but at the same time, both of you have created very simple kind of big ideas that kind of mobilize people. Um, and in Sarah's case, they had a flourishing communities framework with sort of seven key areas where everybody agreed they wanted to see change. And in your case, you talked about your place narrative with your kind of four big ideas. That again, we're providing the, the guiding light almost. I, I suppose it, is it, yeah, it's a lovely idea that it's possible to get everybody to agree on four organizing principles. But, you know, was that easy to, to get that kind of shared vision? Yeah, I think I think at the vision level, it's easy. I think the problem comes then when you start negotiating how we're going to get there and what kinds of activities and also uh, the necessary stage of looking at those high level changes and then looking at what we've got available to us in order to make that happen. And you have to tailor one against the, 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 the other. But I think the trick is to get the high level vision you know, that everybody buys into. And then you can start negotiating, all right, so what would that change look like? What would we need to have um, changed by 2022 in order to make it realistic? And then, of course, what the public consultation does is to problematize all of that. So you'll have seen one of the outcomes was increase in civic pride. So the first thing you get is, well, what does that mean? And what do you mean by pride? And pride for who? And, you know, are we all proud or are some of us proud? And what is it that we're proud of? And, and the, the, the outcome stays, but the conversations then help us all in the room mm. understand from different people's point of view and perspective what that might mean. I, I think also the theory of change has really helped us through the pandemic. I mean, clearly, lockdown has thrown City of Culture 21 into a complete tailspin, as it has the cultural sector across the nation and across the world. And we made a decision that we would not change the theory of change because those are still the changes we want. The story of how we get there will change, but they will remain. And I think that's been a really powerful anchor for us in how, you know, and how we've negotiated the last year and what activity and what programming has gone on despite the pandemic. So, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I just noticed a question popped up from Graham, from Graham Wise that sort of resonated with something that was just in my head and Graham's asked about the extent to which the work kind of aligns with your teaching and learning and kind of research um, strengths really and I suppose it, the question in my head was was almost by this partnership approach and this co-creation of, of goals and, and, and outcomes the risk for the university is, is you're giving up potentially an awful lot of control over what you do and how you do it and over you know conventionally what you might see as your strengths so how do you negotiate uh, between your kind of core obligations to deliver teaching learning and research 
and a really open conversation which might pull you in a direction that's some significant way away from where you feel comfortable. Well, you, you, you call it a risk, I call it an opportunity uh, to, 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 to look beyond. Um, it, it, it encourages a debate about what we mean about university's core business. And I think increasingly, you know, Warwick and many other universities see this level of social responsibility, civic engagement, civic partnership, being at the table when regional and local decisions are being made, economic planning across the board is seen as being an increasingly part of the university. And certainly Warwick, as you, as you know, just uh, initiated their Warwick Institute of Engagement. You know, engagement is seen as being an absolute priority. And what we've discovered during this is that it, it it's a two way street. It feeds. So researchers have seen in what we're doing all kinds of opportunity to do to do research, form new collaborations. We've had artists working with researchers where they're basically artists as researcher and researcher as artists. And that's challenged researchers to think differently about how they research and that's contributed to their work and that will contribute to their impact so i, I think it's a it's it's a flow across and it's um it's um a privileging of the university's responsibility as a placemaker and you can't control that you know you're one of the partners at the table and you have to learn how to negotiate how to be part of how to contribute i think for universities like warwick there was considerable suspicion that this uh, Russell Group University on the hill was going to come down and uh, bestow goodness and culture on the city. And, you know, we had to really work against that. You know, we had to be very mm. patient and very careful in the way that we built our relationships and, and built trust. Great. Thank you so much. So, Mark, sorry to keep you hanging on. Um, I think I think what we're going to do now is is sort of look in a little bit more detail at one of the communities within the city to just explore how this framework has kind of animated your community engagement work. I'm going to talk about work, our work in Canley. Canley is um, right next door to the University of Warwick. Um, there are about 5,000 odd people living there, of whom uh, in normal years, uh, uh, just under 1,500 are students at the University of Warwick. Uh, and the rest are, tends to be people who, um, well, the, the neighborhood scores highly on uh, all the deprivation measures. And uh, the university historically, in the longer term, looking for, for further back, has been, hasn't been great at engaging with Canley. Um, the priorities for the university some many years ago were about making sure we had an international reputation. Um, our interest in Coventry was very limited. Um, we're called the University of Warwick, um, even though we're right on the outskirts of Coventry, um, and we were happy with that. Um, that's changed. That's changed significantly in in recent years. Um, and as part of that, I think the university noticed that the neighbourhood next door wasn't doing very well. Um, and so we tried a number of things to get engaged in there and um, uh, probably about five years ago um, we really started to um, uh, build on things we already have like we had vol volunteers student volunteers would go and help out with particularly with nature based projects over there um, and support particular community leaders over there with small pots of funding for projects they wanted to do um, we, I ran uh, some community leadership training for uh, leaders over there uh, and in conversation with the people who've been through the community leadership training and some others, we decided to run a, a, a community engagement process called Planning for Real, um, which is based around a large, uh, I think ours was uh, six and a half meters long, uh, 3D model of the area. Um, we built that with local school children uh, and others. And we took it around the area. We went to 21 events, talked to 670 people, and got, I think, uh, 1,300 suggestions placed on it um, of things that should be done in the area. We did some follow-up meetings using a process to enable um, residents to be very much in charge as we prioritized with uh, representatives from the university, but also from partners, partner organizations, the city council, the police, others who would be uh, of, of good use in helping turn uh, the neighborhood wish list into practical um, proposals. 
And at that point, there was a global pandemic. So a whole number of uh, proposals such as to have a youth summit um, uh, and to do, uh, to do a bunch of uh, environmental works together with local people and to go move towards um, uh, seeing how we could uh, improve the community facilities again, working together with local people were all impossible to proceed with. Um, uh, so the university has, so that's where we were with Canley, I think as, as Jonathan's work um, and the City of Culture bid came into, um, the City of Culture process started to ramp up um, in, in, in Coventry and the university wanted to be doing stuff there. We got, uh, uh, we bidded for, the, the, the Art Centre at Warwick bidded for uh, some money from an organisation called Spirit of 2012 um, to, to do precisely what Jonathan was talking about, to, to, to fund uh, external artists to come in and work towards the kinds of goals that have been revealed through the Planning for Real exercise and to work to develop to, to develop ideas with local people about what kinds of cultural uh, production might um, contribute to those goals. Because if you go out to most neighbourhoods, Canley is not unlike the, the, the low participation neighbourhood, low interest in the arts neighbourhood that Jonathan was describing in Folsom. And if you ask people what they need and what they want in the neighbourhood, um, more ballet, uh, uh, circus school for the children, um, these, these, these are not the things that people suggest, uh, writing uh, opportunities to, for local people to write their stories or tell their stories. These are not the first things that come to mind. Um, however, all of those things can make a huge difference to the goals that um, the neighbourhood wanted. So, there's, so the idea is to not impose a set of artistic ideas, but to develop with the neighbourhood um, a set of cultural and artistic activities um, that we partly because we can get funding for them um, and to, uh, um, to to roll those out. And that has also been delayed by the pandemic. Um, but we are attempting to do stuff using um, uh, Zoom and other things um, to move that along. Part of what's interesting in, in um, what, what Mark's saying is that Torrington and Canley, Canley where, where he's doing this work, they also had 11% participation in culture and they are less than a five minute walk from the second largest art centre in the UK. So that can't be right. And it can't be about the response being, oh, well, let's take our piece of ballet and opera and dump it in the community and hope that people turn up. It, it, had to, it meant a complete rethink of the relationship between the university and the art centre and that community. And, and the planning for real uh, activity that Mark went, uh, led the community through was enormously powerful. I mean, that was about people actually constructing what they wanted their future to look like and using that as a starting point and then thinking, all right, so what kind of cultural activity will will satisfy that? I didn't show you the profile of uh, Canley. But one of the interesting things about Canley is it's the highest levels of deprivation in the city, lowest levels of cultural engagement, but very high levels of people being satisfied with their neighbourhood, um, agreeing that they can influence decisions and feeling safe at night. So the proposal that we're working towards is for a community cultural pop up centre. And we have every reason to believe that will be successful precisely because we know that people do get engaged, they do want to influence, they do get on well with their neighbours. So it's this trying to use the expertise of the university to work with communities to bring about what they want, but may not understand the choices they have in reaching that. You know, and, you know, Mark's been on this for some time. I mean, what we mustn't underestimate is how long it takes. You can't just wander into yeah. a community as a university like ours and expect to be taken seriously or listened to. You have to you have to put in the groundwork. You have to be there amongst the people and taking part if you're going to be taken seriously at all. These are communities that are offered help and often feel betrayed that that help has never materialised 
or they've had no influence over it or it just hasn't worked because they weren't consulted. So the you know they're important lessons for us all in this in this small but significant project. Great. I suppose just sort of jumping in, Mark, to ask you a question really and, and Jonathan, but it is the extent to which the work, the approach that that both you, Jonathan, have explained and Sarah explained at Winchester, it's a very long process to develop a kind of clear evaluation strategy. Um, and a really significant investment of, of resource to do so. What What is the benefit of doing that in terms of the practice that you then undertake? I wondered how far the work Jonathan has described, Mark, has, has opened up new kind of possibilities for you in terms of the quality and the impact of the work that, that you do. Huh. Well, well, again, all to be said with a caveat that the pandemic has really derailed what else would have been possible but in terms of what we're able to plan and the kinds of conversations we're able to have I think that whole framework the whole city has a commitment to such things as young people and others having an active role in governance and, uh, and decision making uh, that, um, that if, if artists are going to work that, that that whole idea that if artists are going to work with communities it needs to be to the social and economic benefit of the community or the health benefit or the general well-being benefit not just make something pretty that looks that make make something that lots of people come to you take a photograph and get it in the paper and everybody's happy about that which is a lovely thing to do in itself and can be a great morale booster but um so i think there's i think there's a there's an enabling uh effect that means that the kinds of work that i do is it's much easier to find backing for that and also in that conversation about is this is this really about teaching and learning and research or not i think it doesn't mean that i can go to the university and say Canley needs stuff. It's got nothing to do with what the university does. Please give them a lot of money because um, the university doesn't have a magic pot for that. But it does mean that a whole number of people working in the university are interested in having conversations which they don't yet know how to connect with their research mm -hmm. or, you know, is, is going to be a benefit to their students in some way that's not directly related to, to measuring their students' uh, grades. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I, think it's a, I think it's a door opener for sure in terms yeah. of the I think work. there's an interesting uh, question from uh, Helen Featherstone about why yeah. we've chosen planning as a focus for your work, which I think has got a much broader significance for, for university. Coventry is a poor city. You know, it's a poor city and it's, you know, 60% reduction in grant aid. You know, barely able to maintain the services that it's got coming through a period of, of you know, damaging austerity even before the pandemic. And I think what the City Council realised, it, it could no longer provide even the core essential services uh, that it's expected statutorily required to provide, let alone support culture. And that was really the trigger for the City Council getting the anchor institutions, so NHS, the universities, business together to say the only way that we can provide for the city is if we work together on that. And so it's as much about the city council giving up control as it was about the university giving up control. And I think also, you know, the kind of work that we're championing again reflects cuts in the NHS, cuts in youth service, cuts in social care, you know, all of those, um, the, the university's responses to say, well, let's to see what we can do in that gap in that space you know we can't provide full youth services but we can work with youth we can't provide care but we can do programs that support the elderly and the lonely and the isolated so i think it's a positive sign from negative times if you like mm. that, that anchor institutions and cities coming together and realizing that they have a shared responsibility for place mm. and by working together they can maximize the investment maximize the resources maximize the expertise that is applied to place and i and i would chip in that although the, pro the particular process we used in canley was called planning for real which is a process that has at times, more recently, when there was a lot of regeneration money before um, before the 2008 crash, really primarily, um, was used by local authorities to help figure out how to spend regeneration money in a more in a more engaged and equitable way. It actually started as a process to help neighbourhoods plan for themselves their own futures, 
And the way we used it in Canley was not to say, here's the university doing a planning process with you, but to, to ask, the, ask the neighborhood if they would like support in doing a planning process for themselves. And so we, we haven't, I don't think, fallen into the, 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 the potential pitfall of pretending with a local authority. And we've certainly involved lots of elements of the local authority in the later stages of um, letting them write at the beginning what we're doing and then involving them in the conversations about what to do about the uh, desires and, and gaps and needs that are expressed in the process. Great. Thank you, Mark. It's, we're sort of coming to, to an end of, of, of your case study and your story. And again, please, everyone, um, pose pose thoughts or questions into into the chat but i suppose a question i'm i'm keen to ask of, of you really is what might this mean for other universities if they wanted to replicate the kind of approach that you've described it's clearly involved having some significant capability within the university some particular kinds of expertise uh, it's been prepared to invest in some different processes and approaches to to developing projects, et cetera, et cetera. I suppose just trying to get our collective heads around to, to work in this kind of way, which seems to be a very positive way, what would you recommend universities need to think about in order to have the capability to deliver this well and to do it um, in a way that's robust and useful? I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about cultural interventions, I and mean, it's obviously all kind of economic planning, you know, bigger, bigger, bigger stuff that we can, we can talk about. And I think it also depends on the existing relationship between a university or universities and its place. There are two universities in, in uh, Coventry. There's University of Warwick and Coventry University. And Coventry has always been much more engaged with the place than Warwick has. It trains the midwives, it trains the doctors, it trains the therapists, it trains the engineers. You know, it's, it has a much closer relationship. So I think it's traditional Russell Group universities which sometimes have not had that direct impact on place in the way that post-1992 universities have. And then I think the next consideration is whether there's an outside driver or an outside trigger. So, you know, there are at least 10 cities in the country who are thinking of bidding to be UK City of Culture in 2025, and they've all got universities. There are 20 Creative People and Places projects running across the country. And most of those have a link to a university. So it's looking for those opportunities and then, you know, making sure that the university is at decision making tables, you know, we're partner or encouraging uh, city partners to come together and start thinking about positive hope and positive change for their place and what the university's role in that might be. I, I would uh, concur with that, all of that. And I think I'd add um, that it's you need some people who've, who've, who are paid to have the time to do the kind of thing that me and other people in the community engagement team do. And you need to do that over a period of time. So part of part, when there isn't a pandemic on, part of what I do is I go and have a cheap breakfast in a particular community cafe at least once a fortnight. And I chat to who's around. And so I'm, I am a person who's in that neighbourhood. And so I'm not some person who's from outside. When it comes i am from outside but i'm not completely from outside when it comes along i've been doing that for years and that in my job in my job that's all right that's an okay thing to be doing it's not like it doesn't have to just be project bound so that's one thing and then the other thing i think is uh as, as well as with the city of culture there's been a i think there was there has been leadership from the top in this university um when we our vice chancellor started one of the first things he said was he wanted us to be a regionally engaged university and i think that has enabled a whole set of other initiatives to happen which have meant that in doing the city of culture work we've been able to draw on again long-term relationships that are being built um, at a senior level with people in the city council people in the health authority and so on and, and these processes have strengthened those relationships but they've had to grow from existing ones great thank you so much i'm sorry i think i disappeared in the middle of, of your collective answers to that but yeah thank you so much um really really helpful and uh, inspiring work and 
delightfully we will both be able to share the recording of this session if you wanted to share it with colleagues or revisit it but even perhaps more useful we'll be able to look at the underpinning work that's gone into to creating the framework both at Winchester and and at, in Coventry so thank you both very much I just wondered if, if there were any sort of closing comments um, that either of you would like to make just to leave us with a thought before we move to the final part of this workshop well, I just, you know, I just think to reiterate that it's about universities rethinking their role, you know, their civic role, not their research role, their teaching role, or whatever that feeds in, but their, their civic role. We are a huge employer, you know, we have a responsibility. What happens economically, socially, and every other way in, in the region affects us directly. You know, we didn't make the point that it, the, the majority of our uh, lowest paid employees at the university live in the most deprived areas of Coventry. So by working on their on access for their families, their their neighbours, their their community, we're also uh, you know binding or well, helping them you know improving their levels of well-being and their sense of of, of uh, being empowered as employees of the university as well. So I think it is about and I know it's a big movement now. It's not just us, but it is about changing understanding of what the civic role of a university is as part of its core business.